Vasudevaya Janmadya Syagato Diviyat Karatas Jate Suvikya Swarat Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaye Buyantiyat Surayaha Hejo Vari Madam Yatavini Mayo Yatra Chisago Mesha Dam Nasvena Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Parandi Mahi O oh my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O oh, all pervading personality of Godhead. Oh, for my respectful basis is unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primal cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. <laughs> and he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Pujita Kaitravutra Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastavam Atra Vastu Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kim Vapareer Ishwaraha Sadyo Hridi Avarudyate Tra Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, By this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpaturur galitam falam sukumukad amrita dravya samyutam vibata bhagavatam rasam alayam mohor ahoraska buvibhav kaha. O oh, expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam, the mature fruit of the desire to Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian fruit was already relishable for all, 
including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svakata Krishna Vanya Shravana Kirtana Iriantak Slobhadrani Vidu Nati Srihitsatam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna, who is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend and purifies a devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta preesu abhadresu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naistiki. In this way, in this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Amaloba Dayasche Cheta etari navidam Stitvam satve prasiditi. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso. Bhagavat Bhakti Yogitaha Bhagavat Tattva Vidyanam Mukta Sangha Sijayate When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. He becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasam saya siyante chasya karmani jista evatmanishwari. Thus, bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. Understanding, <clears throat> understanding of the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, Verse Number 41. Bacham Juhava Manasi Tat Prana Itare Chatam Mrityav apanam sotsargam tampan chatve hi ojo havu havit hi ajo havit Translation, thus he amalgamated all the sense organs into the mind, then the mind into life, life into breathing his total existence into embodiment of the five elements and his body into death. Then, as pure self, he became free from the material conception of life. Purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj Yudhisthira, like his brother Arjuna, began to concentrate and gradually became freed from all material bondage. First, he concentrated all the actions of the senses and amalgamated them into the mind. Or in other words, he turned his mind toward the transcendental service of the Lord. 
He prayed that since all material activities are performed by the mind in terms of actions and reactions of the material senses, and since he was going back to Godhead, the mind would wind up its material activities and be turned towards the transcendental service to the Lord. There was no longer a need for material activities. Actually, the activities of the mind cannot be stopped, for they are the reflection of the eternal soul. But the quality of the activities can be changed and from matter to transcendental service of the Lord. The material color of the mind is changed when one washes it from contaminations of life, breathing, and thereby frees it from the contamination of repeated births and deaths and situates it in pure spiritual life. All is manifested by the temporary embodiment of the material mind, body, which is a production of the mind at the time of death. And if the mind is purified uh, by practice of transcendental loving service to the Lord and is constantly engaged in the service of the lotus feet of the Lord, there's no more chance of the mind's product producing another material body after death. It will be freed from the absorption in material contamination. The pure soul will be able to return home back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada Patita Bhavani Ki Jai. So, uh, Maharaj Yudhisthira is demonstrating practically how one can retire from all material activities and completely turn the mind to spiritual uh, activities of devotional service. Of course, Prabhupada has made it possible for us by the process of Krishna consciousness to do that from the very first day that we associate with devotees, and especially when, once we become initiated. Uh, that is, to constantly turn the mind away from material preoccupations to service of, of, of uh, Radha and Krishna and, and, and Guru, or uh, dovetailing everything we do into Krishna consciousness, including our work. Now, that is a great art that's called the art of work. It's explained in depth in the Bhagavad Gita in the uh, third, fourth, fifth chapters of Bhagavad Gita. It's, and basically, what does it say? Yasnata karmanonyatra lokamam karmabandhanai. Nadartam tanartam. Let's just see that verse. Tamar Tam Karma Konteya Mukta Sangha Samachara. Work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Otherwise, work causes bondage in the material world. Therefore, O son of Kunti, therefore, O son of Kunti, perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction and in that way you will always remain free from bondage so this is what Prabhupada has taught us to do perform our prescribed duties for the satisfaction of Krishna and Prabhupada says since one has to work even for the simple maintenance of the body the prescribed duties for a particular social position and quality are so made that that purpose can be fulfilled Jagya means Lord Vishnu, or sacrificial performances. All sacrificial performances also are meant for the satisfaction of Lord Vishnu. The Vedas enjoin yajno vai Vishnu. In other words, the same purpose is served whether one performs prescribed yajyas or directly serves Lord Vishnu. Krishna consciousness is therefore performance of jagya as it is prescribed in this verse. The Varnashram Institution also aims at satisfying Lord Vishnu. Varnashrama Charavata Purushena Parak Pumam Vishnu Radhyate Vishnu Purana 3.8.8 Therefore, one has to work for the satisfaction of Vishnu. Any other work done in this material world will be a cause of bondage, for both good and evil work have their reactions. 
and any reaction binds the performer. Therefore, one has to work in Krishna consciousness to satisfy Krishna or Vishnu. And while performing such activities, one is in a liberated stage. This is the great art of doing work. And in the beginning, this process requires very expert guidance. One should therefore act very diligently under the expert guidance of a devotee of Lord Krishna or under the direct instruction of Lord Krishna himself, under whom Arjuna had the opportunity to work. Nothing should be performed for sense gratification, but everything should be done for the satisfaction of Krishna. This practice will not only save one from the, action of, from the reaction of work, but also gradually elevate one to the transcendental loving service of the Lord, which alone can raise one to the kingdom of God. So what does this mean exactly in practical terms? Therefore, one has to work in Krishna consciousness to satisfy Krishna or Vishnu. And while performing such activities, one is in a liberated state. This is the great art of doing work. Well, we have to have guidance, especially in the beginning stages, how we can dovetail our work into Krishna consciousness, whether it's working outside the temple or whether it's work in the temple. And sometimes people get everything mixed up and they think selfish activities is their work, is their dovetailing. The, the, the dovetailing everything into sense gratification. <laughs> but that's not uh, Krishna consciousness and that's not the art of work. And, and instead of becoming liberated, one becomes more entangled by doing that. So what is sense gratification? It's the four things we promise not to do. Meat eating, gambling, intoxication, illicit sex. And things related to that. So therefore, it takes guidance, constant, let's say, advice, especially in the beginning stages, to uh, filter out or extract uh, all those things that are self-interested and engage only in uh, unalloyed service for the pleasure of uh, Guru and Krishna. Well, uh, it's not an easy thing because we've been conditioned many, many lifetimes uh, to work for sense gratification. And then to try and change that habit is a gradual process. But the gradual process, uh, the most important aspect of it is hearing and chanting on a regular basis. This is explained in the first canto, second chapter, uh, where it says, mm -hmm. Let me find that verse. Well, Shinbata Swakata Krishna Punya Sramana Kirtana, Hiriyam Takstu Badrani Vidu Nati Sri Satam. So that verse. Uh, is very, very instrumental in, in directing us to hearing and chanting. And for one who hears about Krishna from the Bhagavatam, and one who hears about him directly through the Bhagavad Gita, is, is itself righteous activity. And for one who uh, hears about Krishna, the, they become purified gradually of the material conception of life and and simply by the hearing and chanting, whereas Yudhisthira is doing it by, uh, Yudhisthira Maharaj is doing it by a meditative process of amalgamating uh, senses into the mind and the mind and so forth into this and that and eventually getting rid of the material conception of life. But one can get rid of the material conception of life by this hearing and chanting also. And it's the most effective way to do it because it's, you're not waiting till the end of life. You're doing it right now. And what is this material conception of life? It's number one, attachment to the objects of sense gratification. The two aspects of the false ego is, or are, uh, I am this body, 
and everything in relation to this body relate, belongs to me. So those are the two things. Aham uh, mameti. I am, uh, I am a product of material nature, and that's the, the whole theory of the scientist that there's only matter. So this aham, uh, uh, the, the I am product of matter is the basis of all modern science, and it's it's also the the, the first uh, part of the false ego. And then the second part is everything in relationship to this body belongs to me. So attachment to the objects of sense gratification is the first uh, principle of the material conception of life. Then one is preoccupied by many material desires, and when one is frustrated, he or she develops hatred and envy. That's another aspect of the material conception of life. Then third, one seeks happiness outside of himself by enticing victims for his sense gratification. He seeks the company of other persons suffering from the same illusions. He dislikes the feeling of loneliness and seclusion as long as he feels successful in materialistic society. Number four, he has a tendency to overindulge in eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Number five, he loses control over the activities of the senses and the mind. Number six, due to identifying oneself with the temporary body, Rather than the eternal soul within the body, he develops the false ego that he is the body and identifies himself with temporary designations of family, race, ethnicity, nationalism, etc. Number seven, he tries to prolong his existence in the temporary body by material strategies of diet, bodybuilding, supplements, plastic surgery, and other medical procedures. Number eight, because of his misconceptions, he develops the false ego and becomes falsely proud of his temporary material achievements. Number nine, he's never satisfied, and whenever he's frustrated in achieving his material goals, he becomes angry and resentful and always blames others for his failures. Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Number 10, when he cannot get as much sense gratification as he wants, he becomes angry and delusional in his behavior. Number 11, he over endeavors to acquire material sense objects and always seeks to be praised for his material possessions and achievements. Number 12, he becomes completely entangled and attached excessively to material things and in his total state of bewilderment, loses all interest in spiritual knowledge and God-related pursuits. Number 13, his mind then is overwhelmed by material considerations, and he becomes continually anxious and fearful as he gets older, sick, and approaches death. So, there are three stages of this material conception of life. Stage one, negligence of spiritual life, because of too much attachment to material pleasures. Number two, fear of an eternal spiritual personal identity that gives rise to the mistaken concept that one may merge into the homogeneous oneness of the impersonal light called the Brahman effulgence. Or either that, in other words, merging into some oneness, or merging into nothingness. And this is the prayer of every atheistic, demonic materialist. Please, O oh God, that doesn't exist, let there be nothing when I die or after my death. That's their prayer. And they're praying, praying to a God that doesn't exist because they don't believe in God. Okay. So their prayer, the prayer of every materialist, is, please let there be nothing after I die. Because if there's something, they're going to be held responsible for all the nonsense they do. You see? So they also pray. They also have hopes, but their hope is that there's nothing after death. See how ridiculous their lives are. And number three, or the conception of void after death that comes from frustration in life from which one develops disbelief in everything 
being angry at all sorts of spiritual speculation out of hopelessness, one may adopt different forms of intoxication and any hallucinations one may experience are accepted as spiritual visions. So these are the three levels of the material conception of life. And another aspect of accepting the material conception of life is the perverted material understanding one develops of different species of life due to ignorance of the soul. One sees only the different types of bodies of living beings, dog, cat, man, elephant, insect, fish, bird, etc. The reality is that the individual soul in each species of life has nothing to do with the incidental bodies that entrap him. One receives a material body according to the different unfulfilled desires of the previous life and karma, the good and bad reactions of activities. So these are, this is all, all of this is the, uh, let's say, the, con the material concept of life. It's very complicated. And there's four stages. In the first stage, one is enthusiastic for spiritual activity. But then one uh, becomes attracted to material things and then uh, begins to neglect spiritual activity. And as one begins to acquire those material things, one becomes enthusiastic for sense gratification. And when one is frustrated in sense gratification, they become enthusiastic to merge into the Brahman and become God. Those are four stages of Maya's attack on a living entity. <laughs> and they're related in some way to Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. You see? That actually, that's why Krishna says, this Trigunya Bhavarjuna, you have to rise above the modes of nature and you have to go, I mean, you, have to, you, you may use the Varnashram system as a stepping uh, ladder to, to Krishna consciousness. But if you just follow the Varnashram system and don't come to Krishna consciousness, the whole thing is a failure. And what happens is you become more entangled in the cycle of birth and death rather than less. So this, therefore Krishna tells Arjuna, the Vedas deal with the three modes of nature. Nischaigunya Barba Arjuna, rise above the Vedas, Arjuna. Okay, so uh, here, Maharaj Yudhisthir is, you, you can see the difference. Uh, he performs all his duties in life in a very nice way. Sometimes it's very difficult for him to do it. Sometimes even he doesn't do it perfectly. But in the end, he has to withdraw his, the senses and the mind from all the material attachments, give up all the titles and clothing and, and different gadgets and whatever that's related to sense gratification and uh, no longer a need for material activities. In other words, not, not even worried about eating or sleeping. However, the activities of the mind cannot be stopped. This is a big point. The activities of the mind cannot be stopped. This is explained also in the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where it says, Nahikashchit sanam api, jatu tista karma krit. Karyate hi avasa karma sarva pakriti jayar gunai. Everyone is forced to act helplessly according to the qualities he has acquired from the modes of material nature. Therefore, no one can refrain from doing something, not even for a moment. So that's why Prabhupada is saying here that uh, actually the activities of mind cannot be stopped for they are the reflection of the eternal soul. But the quality of the activities can be changed from matter to transcendental service to the Lord. So therefore, in the purport, Prabhupada says, in the third chapter, verse number five, it's not a question of embodied life, but it is the nature of the soul to always 
to be always active. The body is only a dead vehicle to be worked by the spirit soul, which is always active and cannot stop even for a moment. As such, the spirit soul has to be engaged in the good work of Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, it will be engaged in occupations dictated by illusory energy. In contact with the material energy, the spirit soul acquires material modes and to purify the soul from such affinities, it's necessary to engage in the prescribed duties enjoined in the Shastras. But if the soul is engaged in his natural function of Krishna consciousness, Whatever he's able to do is good for him. Now, that's the point. This is what Prabhupada did. This, we have to understand what he did. He, he did not do what other people normally do. He did not teach what other people normally teach. He is part of the Brahma Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, and uh, there's Brahma, and, and then there's especially Narada Muni, and Vyasadeva. But Narada Muni is teaching uh, how to worship the deity of the Lord, Pancha Trikibhiti. And therefore, everything is centered around the deity of Krishna, or Radha and Krishna. And therefore, the Hare Krishna mantra is all about Radha and Krishna. You see? And, and therefore, an ordinary man to do what Maharaj Yudhisthira is, is doing here, it's, all, it's impossible. But to do what, what Maharaj Muni recommended, which is to focus one's mind around the deity rather than around the television or around the stock market or around the business, is to focus the mind on pleasing Guru and Krishna. And you can do that easily by chanting Hare Krishna, offering your food, Krishna, before you eat, offering choice prayers. You don't have to make them up. There's millions of cho choice prayers. Bhagavad Gita is a choice prayer. Brahma Samhita is a choice prayer. They're all there already. You don't have to make them any up, right? You don't have to be like the Christians. Okay, let's hold hands and pray now. Dear God, uh, our brothers and sisters are assembled here and they want your mercy and please uh, uh, help Trump get uh, uh, elected and uh, please uh, save our country. And that, it's all a bunch of nonsense, right? Those type of prayers are all nonsense. Uh, but if you hear Srimad Bhagavatam or you hear uh, Rama Samhita Ishwara Paramakrishna Satchitananda Vigraha Nadira Adir Govinda Sarvakarana Kananam Chintamani Prakara Sadma Sukalpa Riksha. There's no give me this, give me that, save the country, uh, you know, get, let Trump get elected or let Biden get elected. No, none of that nonsense. It's glorification of the Lord. That's what a prayer is. It's not asking, give me this, give me that. The people don't even know how to pray. The Christians don't know how to pray. The Jews don't know how to pray. The Muslim, when the Muslim puts his hands out like this during his namaz, he's asking, God, please give me this, give me that. <laughs> you see? So, that, that, that give me prayer is not a prayer. Right? And the Hindus also, they, they also put their hands out like this sometimes. You know, give me this, give me that. You know, or they go like this, give me this, give me that. You know, doing arti. That's not a prayer. Prayer is glorifying God, glorifying his transcendental qualities, his pastimes. That's a prayer. And those prayers are already there. You don't have to make them up. You know? So what Prabhupada did is he, he, he connects us directly to Krishna through his mercy and teaches us how to please the Lord with these simple activities that we do every day. Every day you eat. Every day you sing. Or you uh, say, you talk, so you can orient your talk to Krishna consciousness, orient your eating to Krishna consciousness, orient your working to Krishna consciousness. You see? Especially here in, in uh, Seattle, it's very easy. You get help from companies like Microsoft. They say, if you donate to a nonprofit, we will match it. Uh, that, <laughs> that means they're helping you serve Krishna if your desire is to please the Lord. But, but uh, uh, if you have other desires, then you miss the boat. So this Krishna, this Daivam Varanasram system, everything directed to a pleasing Guru and Krishna, 
is an easy process. It's sublime. And what Yudhisthira is doing here might seem impossible. It's impossible for most people. But it's simply by doing these pleasurable, fun things, uh, you can uh, easily uh, go back to God in this lifetime. That's why he says it's impossible to overcome the material nature, but it's easy if you surrender to the Lord. And surrender means doing these activities, four don'ts and four do's. <clears throat> so then for, for in the end he says uh, that all is manifested by the temporary embodiment of the material body, which is a production of the mind at the time of death. And if the mind is purified, by practice of transcendental loving service to the Lord and is constantly engaged in the service of the lotus feet of the Lord, there is no more chance of the mind's producing another material body after death. It would be freed from absorption in the material contamination. The pure soul will be able to return home back to Godhead. So God bless Srila Prabhupada. He's given us this sublime, easy process to be Krishna conscious, and it all depends on the mind. What's going on inside the noodle here? If you have cleared the mind of all these crazy ideas and just focusing it on pleasing Krishna through these fun activities, chanting, dancing, feasting, but especially hearing and participating in effective hearing where you're engaged in uh, the class to such a point where you have questions and you churn the nectar of uh, Bhagavad Gita Srimad Bhagavatam by those questions, just like Maharaj uh, Prakshit is churning the, the nectar of uh, Sukadev Goswami speaking by asking questions, right? And what happens when you ask good questions? Well, that's explained. First chapter of Bhagav Bhagavatam, it says, The sages said, respected Sutta Goswami, you are completely free from all vice. You are well versed in all scriptures, famous for religious life, and in the Puranas and, in, and the histories as well. For you have gone through them under proper guidance and have also explained them. Besi being the eldest learned Vedantist, O Sutta Goswami, you are acquainted with the knowledge of Vyasa Deva who is the incarnation of Godhead, and you also know other sages who are fully versed in all kinds of physical and metaphysical knowledge. And because you are submissive, your spiritual masters have endowed you with all the favors bestowed upon a gentle disciple. Therefore, you can tell us all that you have scientifically learned from them. Please, therefore, being blessed with many years, explain to us in an easily understandable way, what you have ascertained to be the absolute and ultimate good for the people in general. O learned one, in this iron age of Kali, men have but short lives. They are quarrelsome, lazy, misguided, unlucky, and above all, always disturbed. And so therefore, <laughs> they're glorifying Sutta Goswami and, 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 and saying all these very, very nice things. And then, what happens? Sutta Goswami thank, thanks them and uh, is very pleased that they've asked these questions in such a humble, submissive way, and now he's ready to speak. That is Krishna consciousness. And when you hear that type of conversation, uh, and therefore it says, Tasmat ikana manasa bhagavat satpatam pati shutavya kirtitavya sca smarta deyak puja janityada. Therefore, with one point of attention, one should constantly hear about, glorify, remember, and worship the personality of Godhead who is the protector of the devotees. So that's what we're learning by coming to class. One pointed attention and constantly hear and glorify and remember and worship the personality of Godhead. This is the way to do what Maharaj Yudhisthira uh, did at the end of his life, but we do it every day. You don't have to wait to the end of your life to, to draw the mind away from Maya 
and completely reject all material activities. You can do it every day by this hearing and chanting. That is what's most emphasized in the Bhagavatam. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Well, because you you get on the slippery slope. That slippery slope is once in the beginning, you're enthusiastic about spiritual life. And then you get attracted by something in the material world. Like, for example, let's say you have a 2002 Camry. And all of a sudden, you see in the parking lot, someone has come with a brand new Tesla. And it looks really nice and has these, these doors that go up like wings, right? And, and, you, and it's all electric. There's no gas involved. So, you know, you, you're, you're, you want to be environmentally friendly. You know, you don't want to put carbon into the air. You let the electric company put the carbon into the air. They put more carbon in the air than all the cars all together, right? Delivering you that electricity. And you say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm environmentally responsible. I'm not putting any carbon in the air. But by buying the electricity, you're putting more carbon in the air than the cars. But that's another point. So now you become attracted to it. And you say, oh, no, no, I can't afford it. No, I won't, I won't think about it. But still, it's in the mind now. and. When you get your uh, end of the year bonus, you say, now I'm going to buy it. You say, now, do you actually need that car? You have a car that runs just fine. But the false ego got involved, right? And you got attracted to something, some glittering thing, like a brand new, you know, Tesla or a brand new Lamborghini or a brand new, you know, whatever. And you say, I got to get rid of this thing. You know, it's, it's, it, it doesn't fit my image anymore. I get, I'm, getting, I'm improving my image because, look, I'm making more money. You know, I got to get a better house. And I got to get a better car. And I got this. So that's how it happens. You become attracted. You've never been attracted to something that's not exactly Krishna conscious? Huh? Yeah, all of us. Now, if you, if you, that's called the slippery slope. As soon as that attraction develops, it enters the mind. And to get it out of the mind is not easy once it went in there. And you keep coming back to it until you actually do it. And then when you do it, you get trapped. Maya gets you. So you have to have discipline. I say, look, this is my level. I'm not going past this level of material development. I'm going to maintain it. And anything I make more from this level, I'm going to donate it. I'm going to donate it to the temple. Why should I hoard it? Just like, you know, someone, uh, there was this one uh, devotee, he's not initiated, but he does a lot of service here. One day he came and he was really uh, very disturbed. And we said, what happened? He said, oh, we got robbed last night. And imagine in, in Klahani, you get robbed. I said, what do you mean you got robbed? He said, well, you know, this is, this is Diwali time, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, we went out uh, for Diwali, and uh, we came back, and the house was robbed. And uh, so there was an article in the newspaper how uh, thieves were going on uh, social media and looking at uh, local Indians, especially the ladies, and uh, what they were posting on Facebook. And they saw that they were, they were, they were, they were posting, you know, uh, their, uh, their marriage gold. You know, they, went, they don't wear it all the time. But every once in a while, there might be a wedding or something like that. And, uh, you know, and they're looking at, you know, 
is, that, is it real or is it not real? You know, they were looking at it and they figured out it's real. And uh, they would wear it every once in a while, right? And then at Diwali time, sometimes they wear it or else they wear the imitation stuff. But they figured out, I mean, they're smart. They figured out they must be keeping it in the house. Because if, it was in a, if they keep it in a vault in the bank, uh, you know, they would have to go, bring it home, put it on, then take it back again, you know. So some of those thieves were actually parking in the neighborhood of, of uh, some Indian lady who was posting things on, on Facebook and watching them for a little bit, seeing what their habits were. And they figured out that they're all going to go out on Diwali. And they may or may not wear the, the real jewelry. They might put on some fake jewelry. So they figured out we have a chance of, of stealing the jewelry. And that's exactly what they did. They went in and they got $180,000 of the wedding jewelry of this lady right in Kalani. Can you imagine $180,000 of gold? Right. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing how people figure, I mean, thieves figure things out. You know? and, and then they spread the word around amongst other thieves, you know. Go on the Facebook and look at these Indian women that are married in in America, and uh, see what they're they're posting. So, once you get attached to something, and you don't want to let go of it, and you keep it, you know, under your bed or in, in a wall or in a safe or something like that, uh, your life is in danger. Because once the thieves know you have a lot of money or a lot of valuables in your house. They're going to figure out how to steal it. You know? So this is due to attachment. You see, do you need such valuable things? Like at one point, Prabhupada said, don't accept any gold or silver things for the deities. Because he said, it'll just attract thieves. And he's right. You know, he's right. If you, if you advertise that all the jewelry is pure gold, someone would steal it. Either someone in the temple or someone from outside the temple will come and steal it. That's how dangerous Kali Yuga is. And this attraction to things, as soon as it enters the mind, it's very difficult to get it out, and then you go on the slippery slope, right down into Maya. Hare Krishna. Oh, grace to Sila Prabhupada. Yes. Yes. And then because of those desires, you get another material body. So unless we can purge the mind completely of those type of desires, we're going to get another material body. We're going to take birth again. Haribo. All glory is the Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Don't keep your wedding gold in your house. Don't go 